Welcome back to the Emporium, everyone. Today, we're gonna to be talking about genetics. Our goal of today's video is to explain genetics and show you how to understand them in a simple way. Uh, it's really not that complex. Uh, breeding geckos is very easy and simple to do. Anybody can do it. And I want to show you guys a little, maybe few tips and tricks along the way, some do's and don'ts, and let's go on a journey. Before we go any further, we are going on MJ's The Trap Session Podcast on Sunday the 27th at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Tune in, I'd love to see you. These shirts are badass. There's Patreon membership, trapping is a sport, and so is table tennis. All right, for my next trick, we're throwing it down on the iPad, and there are three ways that genes are inherited and the way they react with each other uh, for leopard geckos, and that's going to be a dominant trait, a recessive gene, and an incomplete dominance, or codom as people call them in short. And uh, there's only, I think, two codoms out there, and that's gonna be um, Max Snow. If you breed it to another Max Snow, you'll get a visually different Super Snow. Same thing with Lemon Frost, um, asterisks next to it, because we'll talk about that later. Don't breed those. Lemon Frost have a Super Form as well, so they'll be codom, uh, incomplete dominant as well the way their genes are inherited. So a dominant gene, you really only need um, one parent expressing this visual gene to pass on to 50% of the offspring and there are no heads. Recessive genes, this, is, this would be like homozygous and heterozygous genes would be um, things like Eclipse where you have to have a visual to a het or a het to a het to produce uh, a visual recessive gene. So um, two separate alleles need to be combined together to create this recessive and we'll show you the details of how we figured that out and how um, I'll do like little circles and stuff for you guys. Don't trip. We got simplest it. simplest way to think about this is eyes, eye traits in humans. So brown eyes are going to be a dominant gene that's inherited and passed along. So we'll take parent one as visually expressing a brown eye. They have brown eyes, but also in their lineage, you'll find that one of their ancestors had blue eyes. So possible head blue, but we're going to say for this sake of this, this one's going to be a hundred percent head for blue eyes. So Parent two, a recessive gene is gonna be blue eyes. And for blue eyes to be present, you can't have anything else in there. It's going to be uh, visually expressed as little b, little b, essentially a recessive, main, meaning that two uh, of these alleles have to be present to visually express this characteristic. So now we're gonna throw it down into the actual Punnett square and we're gonna express this as big B, little b, because it's also het for this, and then this one would also be little b, little b. Also, we should have used something else for brown, like maybe W, but we'll figure it out. Um, and then you wanna put B, B parent one, and then parent two, and then you pretty much bring each square down together, B, 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 and then B, B. So you'll see here that 50% of the offspring will have blue eyes, 50% still will have brown eyes, but they will be het for blue eyes. All right, for another visual example, we'll be taking a look at uh, leopard gecko genetics. So a dominant gene that we'll be using is white and yellow without any hets and then we'll go and use a recessive eclipse. So a visual eclipse would give me E, E, because you need two copies to have a visual recessive of that same uh, genetic. But when you go over to a dominant gene without any heads, it doesn't have any heads, all it can give you is one singular copy of whatever it's carrying. So if it's a dominant gene, only one copy is passed over. And since he's no het for anything, you would have W-E, 
W E and then you would have het eclipses. So from this pairing you would get zero visual eclipses and then you would also get 50% of the offspring would be white and yellow expressing that dominant trait. You see how he did that? And then it gets a little funky when you throw in combinations, but Punnett squares are really easy to show how genetics work. Uh, it gets a little trickier when you have all these combinations and then possible hets are thrown into the mix, then it becomes a little complicated. But let's go ahead and show you how incomplete dominant genes work. For incomplete dominant, we're going to be using Max Snow, and Max Snow is a codom genetic. So essentially you're going to be getting a copy from your mom and a copy from your dad and if one parent is max snow and another is normal your odds would be 50 percent of the offspring would be max snow 50 percent would be normals and this is a baby egg by egg basis when you cross a max snow to a max snow you run the potential of creating super snows. And what that is, is when these two alleles go together to form a, an exact copy acting like a recessive, instead of it having um, the, it's almost the best of both worlds, right? It acts as a recessive because when both are together, two copies are together, they have a visual um, effect, but at the same time, they're also inherited as a dominant trait because 50% no matter what will be inherited and passed on to the offspring. And so you have super snows as the result from a codom pairing max snow to a max snow and you get super snows that have a totally different look than what max snows do and we'll do a little pop pop pop. That's what it looks like and that's crazy, right? That's how codoms work. And unfortunately, there's only two of those right now. Since we're on the topic of inheritance, I just wanted to show you a visual example of line breeding over the span of a few years to decades. What we were able to do within the past 40 years of captivity with leopard geckos is not only were we able to have these three different holy grails of dominant genes, recessive genes, and incomplete dominant genes, but we were also able to selectively breed for color, pattern, and specific other traits, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you went from having pattern where it was speckled, and eventually over time, you get something that almost resembles stripes, and you see today where you have just phenomenal bold stripes and carrot tails and amounts of green in some animals in the emerine projects. Those are all line bred traits and it, it takes time to develop, especially to do it the right way because genetics are so fine tuned when something goes off it usually has a dramatic effect to the integrity of the animal and we'll talk about that right now. This video would be insanely long if I went through all the genetics and all the combinations and possibilities that lies within the realm of leopard geckos. Instead, today I want to touch the topics of the problematic genes and combinations and stuff that causes ailments to our leopard geckos and the genetic structure of the animals and the integrity of the animals. And that's what's most important is that you know which ones to stay away from. And hopefully I do a fair justice of being non-biased, but also I care about these animals and this is something that really needs to be, um, we need a standard, we need a better standard and I wanna help develop that. And this is what that is. Let's start off with the Enigma gene that was founded in 2006 by Mark Bell. Enigma is a dominant genetic mutation that is notorious for neurological issues. The Enigma gene is a color powerhouse and also affects the eye pigmentation. The mutation is tied to neurological issues and stress can act as a trigger for a lot of these symptoms, such as stargazing, spinning, and even seizures. Many have tried to stabilize this line and prove the issues to be a matter of inbreeding, but to no avail. 
Animals that are supposed symptom free usually have yet to have a stressor incident that acts as almost an activation for these ailments. Enigma syndrome is a term used to label the issues with this genetic mutation. Similar to inbreeding, neurological issues are usually a sign that relation and ancestry is too close. But with the Enigma gene, it is an understanding that the genetic mutation itself causes these genetic ailments. Similar to white and yellow, it also affected a little bit of their pattern. As you can see here, a lot of those circles, pattern that was usually spread out seems to almost come together and coagulate. Next up, we'll be talking about the lemon frost genetic. In 2012, gourmet rodents stumbled across the first individual lemon frost. And in 2015, for $10,000, Steve Sykes of Geckos Etc. bought a 1.1 pair at a US ARC auction. The lemon frost mutation is an incomplete dominant gene and therefore has a super form coined super lemon frosts. Lemon frost is a genetic mutation that affects the eyes, making them white in some cases, and it also boosts yellow saturation due to the genetic abnormality caused by this mutation, resulting in an abundance of skin cell iridophores, which are reflective crystals that enhance bright coloration. The mutation occurs in SPINT1, a tumor suppressant gene in the animal's genome. This leads to the lemon frost developing internal and external cancerous tumors. It was thought to believe that lemon frost issues were a result of inbreeding and that it could be fixed via outcrosses. However, the study performed by Dr. Lungwa Gao with the help of animals from Steve Sykes at Geckos, etc., they found robust evidence proving the mutation occurred in spent one in the animal's genome. This study proves that lemon frost genetic mutations causes the animals to develop cancerous tumors and is unable to be fixed via outcrossing. Lemon frost tumors lead to cancerous cells that are a melanoma-based cancer, meaning once they are in the bloodstream, it can mutate to various other types of cancer. And further, in already present genetic mutations, like Tremper or Eclipse, any genetic combination, outcrossing lemon frost to other combos puts those animals at an even greater risk of developing a different type of cancer due to the pretense of another genetic mutation being present alongside lemon frost in the animal's genome. Whammy! Next up, we have Nordizer, or short, NDBE. Nordizer is a recessive trait that popped up in a group of mandarins. Mandarin tangerines were a rebrand of gecko genetic tangerines once they went overseas. NDBE was discovered by Fran and Lady in 2013. Later, NDBE proved out from a male John at Gecko Boa had from the original gecko genetics line from Jason. Today, we understand that the genetic mutation also has some ailments to the animal's genome. Fertility in visual females is a genetic sacrifice of this gene. Other issues result in structure loss. NDBE animals are also prone to hatching with small eyes, no eyes, or bug eyes slash eyes of different size. Green eggs and ham. In my experience, all visual females have been infertile. In the UK, some breeders have proclaimed that they have gotten rid of some of these ailments like smaller eyes over years and generations. However, fertility is still a residing ailment even in selectively catered lines in the UK. Even if one could limit the ailments of a genetic mutation over generations, the fertility issue remains a sacrifice for desire over the genetic integrity of the animal. Bing bong, Joe Byron. Next up, we got white and yellow. In 1996, the year I was born, in Bela Cruz, Porchik was the first one to stumble across white and yellow, and in 2009, Matt of Sosobic Reptiles was able to get his hands on them. White and yellow is a dominant mutation that enhances white and yellow coloration, tends to give them high white sides, and also tends to clean up pattern. When the mutation occurred, many believed white and yellow to be incomplete dominant, and that there would be a super form to the gene. This led to a surge of white and yellow to white and yellow pairings in hopes of proving the gene to be incomplete dominant. 
Inbreeding, or what we call line breeding, is a very delicate process and in, if done incorrectly, it can have very detrimental effects on the animal and their intricate genome. Inbreeding is the mating of organisms closely related by ancestry. It goes against the biological aim of mating, which is the shuffling of DNA. Human DNA is bundled into 23 pairs of chromosomes, where leopard geckos have 38 pairs. Within each chromosome, there are hundreds of thousands of genes, and furthermore, each gene has two copies known as alleles. Without a natural shuffle of relation, these animals would run the risk of genetic ailments. In the mass surge of greed for discovery, lines of white and yellow were line bred improperly. Everything became too related, too fast to keep up with the demand of notoriety, being the first to discover its potential superform. I've spoken on the phone with Chris of Suburban Geckos, one of America's most experienced white and yellow producers, to get his experience documented as well. Our theories and educated experience seem to line up. White and yellow also has a stigma of its issues being compared to Enigma syndrome or even being the same ailment. Some have coined it white and yellow syndrome. Rather than being a genetic mutation altering their genome and cause ailments genetically through the genetic mutation itself, white and yellow seems to be derivative of inbreeding. Lines of afflicted relation are still present in the trade. A white and yellow to white and yellow pairing should never be made. You do not increase your odds in producing more white and yellow offspring, and it only brings the relation to those animals closer, further putting the genetic integrity of the animals at risk. Similar issues are experienced in other dominant, co-dominant, and even recessive genes, leading us to stick firm to our hypothesis of relation being at fault for our symptomatic lines of white and yellow. Let's take Max Snows for example. Being incomplete dominant, a Max Snow to Max Snow pairing can lead to ailments in the genetic integrity of the animal as well. Not that there is anything wrong with Max Snow as a genetic mutation, but that the distance and relation is paramount to healthy animals. Here are some examples of Max Snow showing relation ailments through structure loss deformed faces, slow growth, smaller overall size. These are just a few issues. And then things that are under the surface could be more along the lines of balance issues and neurological issues. It should be said that there are also three strains of albino. These three strains shouldn't be crossed, and not only for the reasons of not being able to identify which strain of albino it is, but also because the genetic mutations occur in different locations within the leopard gecko genome. I love the leaky pipe analogy. A normal leopard gecko has no genetic mutations and is a solid specimen of DNA. When albinism occurs, a genetic mutation happens, altering the ability of an animal to produce melanin a leaky pipe in a house that is the leopard gecko genome. Crossing all three strains together would be three leaky pipes, being that they, all, they are all their own genetic mutation happening at different locations in the genetic genome. A house with three leaky pipes tends to breathe a lot of issues, and for this reason, our three strains of albinos are separate. Crosses of the strains have been referred to as bubblegum albinos. Bye. Ah, make sure you comment, rate, and subscribe. And then follow our Instagram. Thanks for watching, freaks.